I'd like to invite up to the stage Craig Horn uh, from Enterval, who is going to lead the next session. And again, um, to focus in locally here, the first thing he's going to do is give us a history of energy storage technology development over the next last 20 or 30 years, and then bring up some local technology providers. So here you go. All right. Thank you, Susan. Okay. Thank you. Oh, it's way from the TFF. Oh, okay, this one. Great. All right. So, uh, what I wanted to do today is just convey to you uh, uh, the history of battery development here in the Bay Area. Um, it's kind of stemmed from an idea, thinking back to when I uh, finished up my PhD work at Cal in 1998, and coming out, I fell in love with the Bay Area. I didn't want to move, and, and essentially, there was a very few, if any, choices of, of places to work in battery technology here. And contrasting that today, which there's a whole host of activity and there's a thriving ecosystem, um, I talked to Rachel and thought about, well, and maybe people would be interested in, in seeing how uh, history has developed over really the last uh, 50, 60 years here in the Bay Area when you look back to its roots. So um, this is the first time I've given this talk. Um, I'm going to try to, hopefully I've caught most things. I'm sure I've missed some things. Uh, in the interest of time and just uh, uh, avoiding scope creep, I'm just limiting this talk to, to um, battery development here in the Bay Area. Of course, energy storage is much broader than electrochemical energy storage, so I do want to acknowledge that. The other thing is um, also just focusing more on the technology itself, um, pieces of the technology, systems, packs. There is another um, uh, ecosystem, again, around applications, and a lot of people uh, focused on that as well. And, uh, that'll be uh, later on, and, and as well, just uh, here more in the immediate vicinity of, of the Bay Area. So we look through the years, um, uh, limiting it to, to this uh, uh, this subset. We see that from uh, you know going back in, in, in the mid 50s on through the 70s, we had a very small amount of uh, activity here in energy storage within our battery energy storage in the Bay Area. But it slowly started ramping up uh, through the years and I counted about 50 total organizations. This includes national labs, uh, uh, universities, as well as small and big companies, and even uh, research-oriented companies. And the surprising thing was, uh, as you see, um, the numbers change. A couple companies dropped out here and there. Um, but of the 50 I counted, 38 are actually still active. So I was pretty surprised at that. Um, of the 12 that are no longer part uh, of the count, uh, three moved out of the area, and uh, three others uh, changed focus. So there's still companies today, but it didn't seem like uh, that they were working in battery technology. So looking at the breakout then, whether they're working in just uh, um, different components of the technology, uh, electrolytes, um, software uh, integration, or actually working on cells which harness the, the, the stored energy, um, bringing it up to the pack level or even at the system level, um, uh, you know, looked at how that transformed through the years as well. And you can see again in the last uh, 10, 15 years, just a tremendous increase, and I'll talk a little bit about that. Now, the, the, the sums are different than what I showed on the other page because several organizations work on, on more than one of these different things as a kind of as an end product. So to begin with, in the 50s and 60s, really this is where it got its start here. This is the age, of, uh, you know, the age of the atom. Um, things were going modern, but uh, it's really the, the bedrock, the foundation for the, what, what we see here today as the, uh, the battery industry in the Bay Area. Um, at Cal, uh, uh, Charles Tobias started, and over at Stanford, uh, Robert Huggins began. And they performed and started groups that really looked at some of the real fundamental building blocks of what we have in battery technology today. Some of the elect uh, electrolytes that are used, some of the initial electrode studies, um, and uh, some of the uh, characterization techniques. Then um, those started in the 50s and carried through in the 60s, and then in the 60s we really saw the rise of quantitative electrochemistry, uh, primarily with John Newman, who was a Charles Divide student at, uh, at Cal and then became a professor there and really started the whole um, uh, the whole field of quantitative uh, electrochemistry or, or electrochemical engineering as it is today. There also started to be uh, some early commercial work here in the Bay Area through uh, a, a, um, a company, a small company called Electrochemica that was really more of a technology developer, but they had their first patent issued in, in the mid-60s uh, and had a research lab in uh, uh, Menlo Park area. Now in the 70s, uh, things became more modern, uh, popular culture became more uh, uh, part of the mainstream um, in terms of the intersection of science. 
Uh, we started to see computers, personal computers, through the end of the decade, and of course we had the energy crisis, and now things started to change a little bit, and America started to focus a little bit more on energy. Um, if we look at the applications for storage, though, they're, they were still pretty, um, pretty limited, pretty thin, because the technology, just the world of technology itself was still, uh, um, yeah, still in its early stages, and, and so there's really still a few organizations in there. But interestingly enough, uh, Dow Chemical had a pretty vigorous activity here at Walnut Creek uh, developing sodium sulfur batteries with a novel glass, hollow glass fiber um, architecture. And they kept this up through, uh, I think, about the early 80s, and they had as many as 30 people dedicated at, at a facility there in the Walnut Creek area. Um, they were looking at for both stationary and traction power. And, and back in those days, this is way before lithium ion was even a thought. So technologies like sodium sulfur were really one of the, um, uh, were thought of as one of the primary solutions for electric vehicles at that point in time. Uh, EPRI uh, didn't directly work on batteries at their facility, but they did fund a lot of battery work. Um, the beginnings were back in the late 70s. Um, they uh, had bigger support over zinc nickel, or excuse me, zinc chlorine batteries. Uh, the work itself was carried out by a company called uh, EDA in Buffalo, New York, and the systems were tested by PSEG in the Jersey area. Um, they looked to scale this up. They didn't quite get up to 100 megawatt hour. I think they got up to something like uh, two or three megawatt hour systems tested at PSEG. But they really were thinking about grid scale even then in the late 70s, and this is a. Uh, diagram from one of the final reports on what a 100 megawatt hour plant would look like today, uh, or would look like at the time. Uh, Lockheed Martin in Palo Alto also was starting to look at uh, energy storage and, and doing some developmental work. Um, they started a, uh, uh, came up with a patent on the system uh, utilizing uh, ferrous cyanide. Uh, these uh, materials actually are being pursued today, uh, both in and outside of the Bay Area in a number of different applications. Uh, Lockheed um, kept this up for about 10 years or so and then discontinued that and transformed over more to looking at lithium ion and uh, <coughs> um, uh, uh, it, uh, uh, nickel hydrogen systems for, for satellite applications. But this technology, a company in Montana called Vizen, is pursuing this. Um, there's some derivatives of it today that had its roots here in, in the Palo Alto area in the late 70s. So now we come on to the 80s where um, we started to actually see you know, more electronics permeate through uh, society. I remember watching the movie Wall Street in 1986. Like, oh my god, he's talking on the phone on the beach. I can't believe it. Um, of course, you know that and uh, portable computers were pretty large uh, at the time. Most of the size, uh, most of that volume is actually the battery behind it, right? Um, but uh, this actually started now, the number of applications started growing, um, and uh, there's still actually very limited work here in the Bay Area. Um, probably the only thing of note on the commercial side, a company that was used, was a company called Altus, was making lithium vinyl chloride uh, cells for military applications for radar systems and even ICBM missiles. And, uh, and the missile side was there to, as a backup for firing. So these were huge cells, 33 kilowatt hours in a big, huge cylindrical cell. From, from uh, stories I've heard, uh, I never worked there, but I do know some people that did. Um, these large cells actually had to be um, filled inside bunkers because there was so much energy in these. They were lithium metal systems, and uh, the people had blast suits on it. So, um, um, uh, but you know, it was needed uh, for the ICBM application was uh, um, something where they really needed uh, high surety of power, and that's something that lithium vinyl chloride at the time really provided. Uh, unfortunately, in um, late 89, there was an incident where um, some equipment malfunctioned and they ended up having a big fire and it uh, burnt down uh, quite a, a large fraction of the factory. Um, the factory is located at the nexus of 101 and 880, shut down the freeway for a couple hours. Uh, there was a 15 mile backup. Uh, couldn't find any uh, photos, but uh, here's a clip from the. The, uh, the news report from that, and basically Altus kind of wound down operations uh, after that. Um, the other activities here in the Bay Area was there was some early work on polysulfides up, uh, up at Berkeley and more work on high temperature chemistries, but as you can see, the industry around here really relatively was flat through the late 70s and, and early 80s. And then we come on to the 90s. Now, we started even getting you know, smaller electronics, the need for higher um, energy densities, both on the gravimetric and volumetric side, uh, you know, had true commercial drivers, and we also were seeing, starting to see now true electric vehicles out there. Um, so the number of applications for energy storage grew, and of course this rose to greater, um, greater interest. 
Now, right at the beginning of the decade, what happened? You know, there was a, a, you know, basically a, a landmark event in the energy storage world, and that was the introduction of the first commercial lithium-ion cell by Sony, which uh, was just earth-shattering. If you've been working in electrochemistry at the time, I was uh, working in sodium sulfur fuel cell technology down the LA area myself, and I remember that. And uh, essentially what this did was the energy density was so promising that it was basically took every other existing chemistry and, and the thought was, okay, now it's just, it, it's not going to be the right thing for portables and transportation anymore. Those things okay. really now need to go over you know, to the grid. And if you look at some of the early reports in zinc halide, um, like zinc bromine, uh, zinc, um, for example, those actually also were initially developed for, uh, for electric vehicle applications up until the introduction of lithium ion. Also, with this greater <clears throat> commercial activity, we started to see startups now here in the Bay Area. Uh, there were really four of them. Um, I think of, uh, um, that I know of uh, at the time, we had PolyPlus, uh, spin off from Berkeley, looking at the uh, polysulfide chemistry. Uh, valence technology started off in San Jose, uh, pursuing lithium ion uh, through some unique chemistries, ended up in the middle of the decade moving out to uh, Las Vegas area. And we had Polystore, which was spun out from uh, uh, Livermore Lab around the same time Sony came out with their commercial product and uh, had a uh, prismatic, some of the first prismatic cells available in the U.S. and the first lithium ion manufacturer here in the U.S. Uh, in the latter part of the decade. Also a small startup company developing uh, nanomaterials for lithium ion batteries uh, and other applications has started here and that's actually the one place I did find a job uh, after grad school. And so we started seeing a little more commercial activity then. And then we came to the 2000s, and of course now, you know, much greater, um, uh, wider suite of applications. We see the advent of solar energy becoming, le and wind energy becoming less and less expensive, becoming real alternatives to grid, as well as in the middle of decades, spike in energy uh, prices and power prices accordingly, and even more unique ways to uh, pull people around, not only uh, the, the, the Tesla Roadster, which is still the funnest car I've ever driven in my entire life. Uh, it's like a rocket sled, um, but also the, the Segway and, and uh, electric bikes. So the number of applications uh, uh, between the portables, transportation, and the grid, you know, basically now really reached full maturity. We have a full set that we're here talking about today. And likewise, the number of opportunities for uh, young companies grew and grew, uh, not only just the number of companies, but also the diverse set of applications. So we started to see some successes with uh, these and some exits. So at Nanogram, we had a spin-out company, Nanogram Devices, that took some of the technology uh, that was uh, very well suited for medical implantable batteries, that had a Series A uh, spin-out um, with uh, uh, some of the companies. So it was basically a, a fully up and running entity. Uh, in, uh, about mid-2003, and, and a little over a year later, it exited, was purchased for about a 5x return to the investors. So I think this is still today the, the largest return in nanotechnology, and of course now we've seen some even more compelling returns in the battery space, which we heard about this morning with an excellent talk from JB about what Tesla has been able to do in harnessing uh, the, uh, the, the power of 6,831 batteries into to a Roadster, uh, into a battery pack for the Roadster, and the whole concept about integrating these um, high, highly reliable, uh, well-manufactured cylindrical cells and that massive integration into a premium uh, electric vehicle is much different thinking than at the time of taking uh, the more uh, less mature large format cells and putting those in a very inexpensive uh, uh, commuter vehicle. And of course, the, the rest of that's history. But we also saw some vigorous investment by the venture community in lithium ion. And this really, to me, came because of the success that a uh, Boston based company, A123, started seeing around the middle, of, uh, uh, in the middle of the 2000s when they signed a supply agreement with Black and Decker. This spawned a number of new startups, I think, uh, really changed the way of, uh, showed the pathway that uh, a venture company can have success in lithium ion space. Um, and then we also saw some uh, alternative chemistries designed for stationary applications that instead of being more about the cell, like uh, a company like A123 or, or, or these other ones up at the top, really with stationary, it's, uh, you're really developing an entire system uh, around a cell that doesn't really stand alone by itself. So in addition to Interval, we have Primus Power, who we'll hear about uh, in a few minutes here, as well as Dia Energy, who is now uh, recently changed their name to Energy Power Systems. 
um, all got our start in the uh, mid to latter part of uh, the last decade. So now we're at the 2010s where things, uh, people now are thinking more about grid resiliency, microgrids, we got Hurricane Sandy, we have the zombie apocalypse, you know, we got to think about, you know, how, how can we, how can we protect what we have, right, and, and face the ultimate test. And that's really where energy storage, I think, finds, you know, um, uh, some additional parts of the value stream really come to light. And so with that, we see today we have over 75 companies here in batteries alone, according to Kettle Charge, which is another example of how the, the, the overall market drive and the industry has matured and the ecosystem around here is with an organization like CalCharge to, to be that center of gravity pulling in all these different entities, labs, uh, development firms, uh, small commercial companies, large commercial companies, and then users of energy storage all into one place. So very excited. It's only been a couple months that the launch for CalCharge has taken place and be exciting in the years to come to see what's happened. But, you know, we see that some of the big companies around here, like IBM with its lithium air technology, has really started in and put full vigor in, in developing battery technology here in the Bay Area, uh, as well as some of the, the mega companies out there, but working on very small systems. So Apple has now some patent applications in actual lithium ion chemistry, rather than the ways that you use lithium ion cells uh, uh, you know, more efficiently in a handheld. So they're really looking at the, the total stream. And to small companies like Intervault that are starting to introduce products on the megawatt hour scale, which I'll talk about here in a few minutes. We're also seeing the intersection of storage with uh, the notion of more traditional things in the tech sector. Here's a, a couple uh, companies here. I know there's some others in the audience I've learned about today, as well as uh, um, a few more uh, juice box. Um, uh, just want to note. Um, so, um, you know, we're seeing things go beyond just the chemistry itself, and that's, that's very exciting, too, because it's a new day to come. So that's a quick synopsis that I had for today. Uh, maybe in a couple of years we can come back, uh, talk, you know, broaden a little bit more, both geographically and on the technology base as well as the uh, application space. So happy to hear any questions on this, tips. Uh, if you want to rant, you can tell me now, or here's my email address. So send it there. Thank you. I want to take like, two questions about this and then sure. let you go on to talk about interval. Okay. But any questions for Craig? Everyone wants to hear about interval. Uh, <laughs> no? Shall we move on? Okay. Okay, let's go on to your next presentation. Okay, great. Uh, I guess before that, I'll ask the rest of the panelists to come on up because this will be the formal panel part of the thing. So we have. Uh, Now I'll uh, talk to you a little bit of uh, some insight as to what we're doing over at Enervault Corporation. So as a quick overview, we are a company focused on grid scale, long duration energy storage. Uh, megawatt hour scale and above is, is the market space that, that we're looking at. And we have a, a system offering that um, is distinct in that it delivers long duration uh, with steady power for long duration. It's a system with very long lifetime, 20 plus years. Um, and has an unparalleled combination of safety, uh, reliability, and cost. Uh, we're located down in Sunnyvale, and we have a number of strategic investors behind us, including uh, Total, 3M, Mitsui, uh, Tokyo Electron, which will soon be, uh, hopefully, uh, applied materials here in the Bay Area, uh, Commercial Energy California up in Oakland, uh, Ocean Shore Ventures, Aaron Group. And we also have uh, um, great funding from the U.S. Department of Energy, the California Energy Commission, and the uh, New York State Energy Research Development Authority. Um, the focus, uh, as I mentioned, for Intervault is uh, large scale. We see ourselves as a provider of systems in the, the tens of megawatts, hundreds of megawatt hours. I'll talk about some of the exciting opportunities out there in that space. But today we're starting off, um, uh, we have a system that uh, is in the field at 250 kilowatt, one megawatt hour. Um, that I'll talk about in a, in a few minutes. 
the drivers and benefits of storage, I'm sure everybody here is, is, uh, is tuned to, but what we see at Interval really that there is an unrelentless drive in energy storage to help decarbonize the grid and increase the overall resiliency. And a number of benefits will, uh, will result from that, including lower energy costs and increased uh, reliability for the grid. In order to do that, um, we need to have, uh, there needs to be technologies, there needs to be products out there that, that can satisfy the need. Um, what we see is that there's been a, uh, an absence of uh, economic offerings in the space of um, singles to tens of megawatts and tens to hundreds of megawatt hours. Um, redox flow battery architectures, which uh, our products are based on, offer a combination of cost effectiveness, but also flexibility and modularity as well as safety that really uh, are well suited uh, to, to address this gap. We look today, uh, the drivers uh, for, um, uh, for uh, systems in that space uh, are, are very strong and we're starting to see now uh, utility procurements that if you add them up, uh, we estimate you'll see about a billion dollars of grid scale long duration energy storage be procured over about the next 18 months. Uh, Long Island Power Authority um, had a uh, RFP out, uh, the GSDR RFP, that they were looking for uh, a total of 150 megawatts of 12 hour storage. So that comes to uh, uh, over 1,800 megawatt hours of energy storage. And of course, that's energy that has to be delivered at that main plate rating. Um, the, didn't, uh, the, the requirements for this were uh, to have large systems, 12 and a half to 50 megawatt uh, per site. So you're talking about anywhere from 120 to 600 megawatt hours in one facility. So very large storage. Of course, we also had several procurements around here in, in California taking place with Southern California Edison and the uh, RFP RFOs. If you all add all those up, you'll see that you get over uh, 2.4 gigawatt hours of energy storage that's already out there on the street. So if you contrast that with uh, the short duration applications, you know, there's roughly about 400 megawatts out there, and that really only comes to 200 megawatt hours. So it, you know, it's megawatt hours that, that really drive factory building drive the industry so it's a it's a pretty exciting time <laughs> technology at interval as I mentioned uh, is a redox flow battery we're doing a ver uh, variant of, of redox flow batteries called iron chrome uh, iron chromium chemistry this was actually the, the first chemistry studied uh, in redox flow batteries by NASA in the 70s and 80s uh, among the attractive attributes are it's a very low cost it's a very robust chemistry um, it also uses widely abundant reactants. There's over 220 million tons of chromite uh, in northern Ontario. That would be uh, over 150 years supply of energy storage for a factory putting out over 40 gigawatt hours per year. And it's an inherently safe chemistry as well for a number of different reasons. Um, the re uh, reaction is a simple uh, reduction oxidation reaction involving uh, chromium chloride and iron chloride dissolved in water. So we're talking about metal salt solutions. Uh, it's a uh, aqueous electrolyte, so you don't have to worry about thermal runaway. Um, at Interval, we've uh, uh, taken that core uh, technology that NASA developed that was in the public domain and developed a novel architecture that helps deliver sustained power and also has several innovations that help make iron chrome commercial and uh, release uh, the potential of that chemistry. So over the timeline of the company, over the last four years, uh, the team's done a tremendous job scaling up from initial 100 watt hour lab cells to the megawatt hour system I'll show you today. But uh, if you look at, no matter what the system size is, and redox flow batteries in our systems in particular, you can think of them in four separate blocks. You have your energy block, which is uh, the reservoir for, for the water that holds the energy. You have a power block which has the stacks, those directly convert the, the chemical energy to electrical energy, and then the distribution block that brings uh, energy from uh, point A to point B, which is essentially pumps and, and valves and piping. And then the, the controls block converts AC to DC and keeps everything um, uh, uh, in place. Um, an analogous type system to a redox flow battery is a water treatment plant. So I've seen some large scale water treatment plants, they have a small electrolysis unit, that's the power block, they have reservoirs, that's the energy block, and they have control functions and, and piping to bring the water from point A to point B. So very similar to that, we have metal salt, about two weight percent dissolved in water, and that's how we get uh, an energy storage system. Our system delivers constant power for uh, periods of time as long as you deliver electrolyte. That means that we have a very low marginal cost of, uh, 
of an extra hour of storage because to go from one hour to two hours of storage, we just need twice the volume of the electrolyte. Because of the low cost of iron and chromium coming from the ground, uh, iron uh, ore and chromite ore uh, that, you know, are essentially $4 a kilowatt hour. That means at large scale and for long duration, you can have systems that can be less than uh, on the order of $100 per kilowatt hour all in. Um, and that is uh, a usable kilowatt hour derated for both um, uh, uh, efficiency and state of charge range, true usable kilowatt hour. Now, you know, it's, it's a long duration type system, and so whenever you think about the price of a redox flow battery, you initially have to think about that energy to power or hours of duration or, uh, ratio in, in specking that price out. So today, um, as I mentioned, we're <coughs> de developing or uh, de we've deployed in the field a 250 kilowatt, one megawatt hour system. You can see here some photos. We're in the process of ramping up the, uh, the system is installed in, in commission and in the process of uh, ramping up the, the power and energy uh, ratings of the system. Um, you can see here the different uh, blocks. Again, it's the, the four main building blocks constitute that system. To scale it up twice the energy, we need 30% uh, larger tanks. To go 10 times the power, we just need three times the diameter of pipes. So these types of systems scale very well. The other thing is that in order to have gigawatt hours, we don't need uh, gigasize factories. We can leverage a lot of the existing manufacturing base out there for uh, chemical systems, water treatment plants. So the, the hydraulic module is something that you can find in most any region around the world. We make the stacks using the hazard special technology at Intervault. Tanks are tanks. You find those around the world too. We have partners for electrolyte that can scale and the inverters. So all these different four blocks come together. Um, we can offer a high degree of local content in regions uh, where we go to market. So to go to the next step, uh, we're, we're learning a lot from our 250 kilowatt systems. At a very exciting time, we have uh, our dedication event for that tomorrow, and uh, it's going to be very exciting. We have over 80 people coming uh, from two hours uh, drive from either Sacramento or here to to a nice party in the middle of an almond orchard, which uh, takes a lot of uh, a lot of details to attend to. The team's done a great job with that. Uh, but we'll be scaling up and introducing a megawatt scale commercial product um, that can be modular to megawatt scale. Um, and, uh, and then the following year in 2016, 10 plus uh, megawatt scales that are power plant size. So uh, um, you can see here that, as I mentioned, the process of scaling is pretty straightforward for a full battery system. Uh, we've participated in a number of different studies of cost competitiveness um, um, with Epri, Lazard, uh, LCOE analysis. The, the attributes uh, of, uh, of our system are such that they compare very, very, compare very favorably, excuse me. Uh, on an LCOE basis, uh, application basis, and if anyone's interested, I can show uh, some detailed behind this and other application studies that we have. So with that, uh, happy to take any questions, and then I'll turn it over to Andy Marshall, who will tell you about uh, our approach to grid scale energy storage. Great, thank you, Craig. I'm looking forward to the dedication ceremony tomorrow. I'm curious if you will uh, be serving almonds. Uh, almonds will be on the menu. Awesome. All right. Do we have any questions for Craig? Thank you, Craig. Um, my name is Ian Holman from CTIC Capital. Here's about uh, can you address a little bit about your commercialization strategy and good market strategy? Um, well, uh, it, 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 can you be a little more specific? Uh, it's, a, it's a pretty broad topic. Okay. Uh, you mentioned that you're commercializing, uh -huh. correct? Good. You're already at large scale. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, so what's your next step in terms of setting up your plants uh, okay. and yeah. where you're actually going to build? Right. So, so right now the team is, uh, uh, has a laser focus on, on cost reduction and, uh, uh, manufacturability. So we're taking um, the, the developments from this first system, uh, we're in the process uh, and have been uh, continuous improvement on that. That'll lead to the availability of megawatt scale systems um, at, at the end of 2015. So the development will still continue. We'll be scaling up uh, both uh, you know, the power modules and the support structure of that to um, systems suited for 10 plus megawatts uh, in, in the 2016, uh, at the end of 2016 rather. Um, the manufacturing 
Um, again, we, we manufacture the, the stack stack sets here in Sunnyvale. We have partners uh, throughout the United States and other parts of the world that are set up to do um, uh, things like the hydraulic plant module and tanks and, and electrolyte. Any more questions? Thanks, Craig. I really like your talk, the first talk, and also I like the uh, Enervo's battery technology as well. And I think uh, ultimately for grid energy storage cost is a major issue. And the uh, aqueous system and this simple chemistry is really very attractive. But uh, I also have a question on the efficiency, of the round trip energy efficiency. I know that uh, for Great energy storage efficiency is also important. You also have a pump, also the aqueous system. You have the hydrogen evolution problem, and uh, what is the about the battery efficiency so far? Mm -hmm. um, well, efficiency really plays into LCOE, and, and I think with when you talk about all in efficiency, you really have to look at the overall use case. Um, because you know there are times when the battery will be idle, and it's important to understand what what the impacts of that are. So what we see at Interval, um, our commercial systems will have a cycle efficiency in seventy percent range, um, uh, maybe much higher than seventy. Uh, the actual all-in round trip efficiency over a year, I think, is really a, a matter of the use case. So you know, for example, um, last year Enel and Siemens published a paper on some results of a lithium-ion system on the island of Acernia in the Mediterranean. Um, they reported, uh, it was a lithium ion based uh, system, and reported cycle efficiencies uh, of 85%. But then when you look at the parasitics that had to occur, right, it was actually a pretty big impact on a daily basis. Now, if it's a Saturday and you don't have an economic reason to run that battery, but it's still very hot out, you actually need, still need to run the AC, right? Because temperature's temperature and that can impact lifetime. So you really have to, that's where you have to look at the impact of you know, all the energy consumption of that system, not only when it's being used, but the hours in the day that it's not being used, the, the days of the week that's not being used at all, as well as on a season to season basis. And I think when you really look at that, a lot of energy storage systems are right around 66% or so all in. So the thermal robustness of our system actually limits how much parasitic energy that needs to be applied during those idle periods. All right, I think we're going to have to cut the questions off there and, okay. and move on.